Okay, so let's move on to the presentations. A couple of years ago, I joined the ABIM Hematology Committee. Um, somebody had to do it. Apparently, some of the previous committee members had been stoned by angry test tapers, so there were some vacancies. Uh, but one of the things we've really tried to do is actually get away from the real trivial pursuit type questions and ask things that are important for people to recognize um, and focus on that rather than these somewhat esoteric things. And uh, it seems to be having an effect. This year the hematology recertification and initial certification had the highest pass rate in history. So 93% pass rate for recertification and uh, about 85 for initial. So uh, there is progress. Anyway, uh, I'm going to talk about CHIP and ICUS, which in some ways is appropriate for the first presentation because this is really where MDS often begins. And these terms are uh, increasingly uh, being used uh, in clinical practice uh, to describe uh, our patients. And they, CHIP in particular, which we'll talk about more in a moment, is largely a consequence of aging, of the types of changes that occur uh, as we get older, the result of the sort of cellular game of telephone that occurs throughout life where the message, the DNA message, gets increasingly garbled over time as mutations accumulate. And that can lead to, if those mutations are in the wrong genes, in the wrong places, to a clonal process. And these occur in various organs, most prominently the skin and the mucous membranes, but what's of most interest to us is the clonal states and the hematopoietic system. And we're all very familiar with monoclonal gammopathy of undetermined significance, which is present in 5 to 7% of adults over the age of 70. Monoclonal B-cell lymphocytosis, which is even more common depending on how sensitive the flow cytometer is that you, you look. And then this new state, this uh, state defined by mutations in pre-leukemic driver genes, which we called clonal hematopoiesis of indeterminate potential, because it usually doesn't turn into anything, but can result in MDS or AML. One has to understand these clonal states in the context of the fact that cytopenias are extremely common as we get older, and by age 85, more than 25% of the population are anemic. About a third of that anemia is due to a nutritional deficiency. About a third is due to either anemia of chronic inflammation or endocrine renal insufficiency. But epidemiologically, about a third of it is unexplained. And some of these patients have MDS that hasn't been diagnosed yet. Some of them have uh, occult inflammation or perhaps androgen deprivation. Um, and some of them just have uh, clonal states that may be contributing to ineffective hematopoiesis but aren't yet at the point where MDS can be diagnosed. And that's because our World Health Organization, although they're doing the best they can, it's, it's a big process to do these WHO revisions. It takes multiple years, and it's hard to keep up with the pace at which the science is moving forward. And so even the last years, um, WHO classification really didn't include to any extent molecular data as we're learning about it. So in order to um, define WHO or MDS according to the WHO, one either needs, um, one needs a meaningful cytopenia and then either increase blasts, which is easy, extensive dysplasia, which is more subjective and there's a lot of inter-observer discrepancy about that, uh, and if neither of those are present, then certain chromosomal abnormalities, such as DEL5Q or monosomy 7, other chromosome abnormalities don't really count. If you have the cytopenia but none of the rest of it, and you've done a workup of the patient's cytopenia, haven't found a cause, then that's where this term ICUS gets used idiopathic cytopenias of undetermined significance. And this is a term that's really agnostic about clonality. It either means somebody checked for a clonal mutation and didn't find it, or somebody just didn't check, perhaps because uh, they were uh, unable to, to do so um, uh, because of insurance reasons or other barriers. And so uh, what we really need to do, though, is to move uh, this idiopathic cytopenias of undetermined significance 
uh, beyond the morphologic era, which we've been in for the last 25 to 30 years, and really into the era where the molecular patterns define the biology of the disease and the natural history of the disease. Of course, it's still important for us as clinicians to rule out other things that look like MDS. And a few times a year, I'm referred patients with MDS who have several of the different uh, mimics uh, on, on this list. Copper deficiency is, a, uh, is, is one that uh, is common uh, now, given the prevalence of bariatric surgery and the number of people who take zinc supplements. Um, I've had a number of closet alcoholics uh, that came in billed as MDS. And then, of course, there's, you know, people don't always think methotrexate can cause cytopenias and dysplasia. And if you're on that for rheumatoid arthritis, um, it's not necessarily MDS. So we have to rule out uh, these sorts of things. Now, uh, in the last uh, 10 years, there have been more than 40 different genes uh, that are recurrently mutated in MDS that have been described. In 2005, we only knew about five of them, um, and they were all actually fairly uncommon ones, except for TP53 and therapy-related disease. Um, and the majority of these are in two pathways. In the splicing pathway, those are illustrated here in red, and in the um, epigenetic and chromatin remodeling pathways. And the most common mutations, SF3B1 and TET2, are only present in about 20 to 25 percent of patients, but collectively the majority of patients with MDS have a mutation in one or both uh, of those uh, pathways. Activated kinases of the type that you could give a imatinib-like uh, kinase inhibitor to are actually quite rare, and that's part of why I think MDS has lagged behind some other neoplasias in terms of the therapies. Now, testing for these mutations is now widely available. There's lots of different commercial labs that offer. Um, there are uh, institutional panels, my own in institution. It's now part of our new uh, screen for MDS patients. Whenever we see somebody new, we always get the rapid heme panel. And in the rare occasion when the insurance company says we're not going to pay for it, with the institution eats the cost. They can afford to do that because they charge four times more for the panel than it actually costs to run, so that's how the economics work. But if you do such a panel and you don't find a mutation, actually you should really um, think again about whether the patient has MDS. And, and there are certainly patients who have mutations that aren't described, just like there are triple negative MPN. Um, but it does, I think, uh, particularly in ambiguous cases, help to have a high negative uh, predictive value. Carl Sagan, the, the great uh, scientist and, and explainer of scientific concepts, uh, who died of MDS uh, about 20-some uh, years ago, said evidence of absence is not absence of evidence, or the other way around. Um, and, and I think that's true. So again, a negative predictive, or a negative result doesn't exclude MDS, but it certainly does make it uh, less likely. Now, if the panel's positive, however, then the situation is a little bit more murky because we've known for a few years now that leukemia-associated mutations can be identified in uh, healthy uh, older people. The majority of these are single mutations. The majority of them are DNMT3A or TET2 changes. Um, and they're usually C to T transversions, which suggests that they just arise by spontaneous deamination and incorrect repair of that uh, uh, by the, the cellular uh, machinery. So this is a, a sort of molecular hallmark of aging. If you, if you take a biopsy of skin and you sequence the skin cells, you find uh, uh, loads of mutations, and the majority of them are C to T transversions. They come from the damage that ultraviolet light does. If you look at a cigarette smoker and biopsy their tongue and uh, sequence it, even somebody who doesn't have cancer, it doesn't even really have dysplasia yet, you are going to see the field effect mutations, and most of those are C to T transversions in precancerous uh, uh, genes uh, in the, the oral epithelium. So um, these mutations accumulate at a rate of about uh, 1.3 exonic non-synonymous mutations per hematopoietic stem cell per decade. And when we find them, even if it's at a very low variant allele frequency, if, even if, say, the panel comes back and says this DNMT3A mutation is present at a 3% level, that's still a thousand-fold more than that particular uh, 
hematopoietic stem cells should be contributing to normal hematopoiesis. So even these very small variant allele frequency clones that we may tend to dismiss are already quite expanded compared to, to what they should be. By age 70, 10% of the population have detectable hematopoietic stem cell clones that are at, at least the 2% variant allele frequency level. And if you look even deeper, if you use very targeted resequencing with error uh, correction, uh, you can find almost everybody uh, has a clonal mutation. Almost everybody in this room uh, is, is over 35 to 40, and so almost all of us have um, a, a mutation in our hematopoietic stem cells, which is a, a scary, scary scary thought, actually. Um, this is a very extreme example, this Dutch lady who lived to age 115. Um, she had 450 different somatic mutations that were detectable above the 2% level in her peripheral blood. And interestingly, she had a normal CBC, she had a normal um, RDW and MCV, and her chromosomes were normal. And she was incredibly sharp, actually, mentally as well. In fact, uh, uh, she lived alone until her, her final year of life when she moved into an assisted living facility. She was the oldest woman in Europe at the time, and so the, uh, she was a big football fan, and the Ajax Amsterdam team actually came and visited her. And none of the other people in her assisted living home were that interested in the, this very famous football team coming to visit her. And, and uh, she, you know, said they, they just didn't know what was good. She did have uh, certainly very short telomeres by the end uh, and eventually died of gastric cancer without any vascular uh, or dementia-related pathology. Now, having a clonal mutation, however, in one of these pre-leukemic drivers is a significant risk factor, not only for MDS and AML, but also for all-cause mortality. And Sid Jaiswal and Ben Ebert, when they looked at this uh, three years ago, uh, were able to show uh, uh, quite convincingly that uh, there was an increase in all-cause mortality with clonal hematopoiesis. And this has become illuminated a little bit more just in the last few months. In January, there's a paper from a Boston University team looking at TET2 uh, mutations in LDL receptor deficient mice. It turns out it's actually fairly difficult to give mice atherogenesis in their relatively short lives. But you can do it by knocking out the LDL receptor and then feeding them a very fatty gruel. If you then introduced uh, TET2 negative uh, marrow, they actually get very accelerated atherogenesis. You can biopsy and see little cholesterol crystals. And the only change between the background LDL receptor deficient mice who get atherogenesis but not particularly quickly and these TET2 is, is that they have clonal hematopoiesis. And in fact, this clonal hematopoiesis uh, vascular changes can be abrogated by using anti-inflammatory molecules, which suggests that it may be because of an inflammatory interaction between the clonal cells and the vascular endothelium uh, in these individuals. Now, I don't have a slide from this because it was just in the um, New England Journal last week, uh, but uh, Ben Eberslab showed uh, virtually the same thing and looked in a much larger group of individuals. The original study had been in about 14,000 people. They've now looked in 80,000 people from pretty much every GWAS study that was done in the last uh, 10 years that they could get data from where blood had been sequenced and, and showed convincingly that um, clonal hematopoiesis is as much a risk factor for cardiovascular disease as cigarette smoking and as uh, hyperlipidemia. So given that this is present in 10% of the population over age 70, it's probably something that we need to uh, start paying attention to. Now, what if you just have a patient who has cytopenias, there's no dysplasia or minimal dysplasia, not enough to be diagnostic in the marrow, but you do find a mutation? Um, Luca Malcavati in um, uh, Italy uh, looked at a fairly sizable cohort and found that if a clonal mutation is present, those patients have a natural history that's very similar to MDS. Now, this differs a little bit from the people we were just talking about a mo moment ago who have normal blood counts but a mutation. So that's CHIP, normal blood counts mutation. These are people who have cytopenias and either don't have a mutation, so idiopathic cytopenias, we don't know why their counts are low, or do have a mutation, the clonal cytopenias, or CCUS. And those CCUS people really do, do um, uh, progress 
and die of uh, cytopenias and die of uh, leukemic progression at a rate that's quite similar to low-risk uh, MDS. The number of the mutations, the size of the mutant clone seem to matter in Luca series. Other people are looking at this uh, to try to, to validate. And uh, splicing uh, genes seem to have a particularly high predictive value for the myeloid neoplasm uh, evolution. So I think we're, we're in an era where we are um, about to change where the threshold uh, of diagnosing uh, MDS begins. And right now, uh, I made an analogy at a, a meeting a couple of months ago. Um, I was an astronomy major a, as an undergrad, and so we, we paid particular attention to when the sun set and when twilight occurred. And it, it isn't until the sun really gets down to about 12 degrees below the uh, horizon that it, that it truly gets dark enough to start to see the, the stars. Uh, when the sun first goes down, you can actually still read a newspaper just by the, the glow in, in the sky. I think uh, at the moment we're not diagnosing MDS really until uh, things are, are completely dark, but I think um, uh, increasingly, we're going to be diagnosing it at early stages where we're finding these mutations in association with mild cytopenias and where hopefully we're going to be able to intervene on that. One of the problems we have right now, of course, is that our drugs are pretty crummy and we don't have very many of them. And so um, uh, Amy and Rami are going to talk a little bit about uh, that and, and uh, hopefully prospects for better um, uh, outcomes in the future. Because our, our myeloma colleagues who have an embarrassment of, of riches of, of effective drugs and safe drugs are now starting to treat smoldering myeloma and there's even uh, trials going on looking at high-risk MGUS to try to prevent um, the myeloma from developing. And so maybe someday we'll, we'll get there uh, in MDS. So this is my, my last slide. We, what do we need? We still really need some good natural history studies in uh, cytopenic patients with or without mutations. I think Luca's study is important and other groups are, are doing similar studies. Um, we often find uh, when somebody's having myeloma or um, lymphoma staged uh, and a molecular panel is sent off that a mutation is found um, and you know, there's always a lot of debate. Should that exclude them from a clinical trial? What does that mean in that context? If you treat the myeloma, are you going to promote outgrowth of an MDS clone? Those are all, I think, valid concerns, and they're, they're things that we need to look into uh, more. Something that uh, has certainly changed our practice uh, in using um, uh, donors who are older siblings of patients with MDS is the frequency of CHIP. And so we're now very reluctant to use uh, donors uh, over age 60. We haven't quite gone as far as Johns Hopkins has and started using almost all haploidentical uh, uh, donors in that group, but, but certainly that is the, the trend. And if we do use an older donor, we're checking them now for clonal mutations because they, they do worse. Chris Gibson had a a letter in blood a few weeks ago uh, showing donor-derived leukemias and just poor engraftment uh, if these mutations are, are present. As mutation testing gets cheaper, I think it's going to change really how we approach patients. Um, right now, the cost is already less than karyotyping and routine hematopathology in, in many uh, centers. So, you know, is it eventually going to uh, replace bone marrow biopsy? Because it, it certainly uh, predicts the biology of disease better than counting blasts does. And then the questions I alluded to a moment ago, can we prevent clonal evolution? Can we reduce cardiovascular or all-cause mortality by getting rid of some of these clones? Or are we just going to be playing whack-a-mole and get rid of one clone only for another to emerge because this is just part of getting older? This is just part of the aging process, and some people happen to have gotten their mutations and in the wrong genes that, that cause clonal outgrowth more than others. So thank you uh, for your attention.